All right, hello everybody, and welcome to our talk on Call for Code with the Linux Foundation and how you can contribute to tech for good projects, even if you're not technical, if you don't write code. Uh, with me, I've got Demi Ajayi, and my name is uh, Daniel Crook. Let me just pop over to the intros. And Demi, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then I'll take us to the agenda. Sure. Thanks so much, Daniel. Hi, everyone. As Daniel said, I'm Demi Ajayi. I'm the open source community manager at Call for Code for Racial Justice. So my job is to bring people into our community, both um, developers and non-developers, and get them excited and contributing to our projects. Wonderful. And I'm Daniel Crook. I'm the chief technology officer for the Call for Code program, uh, as well as the um, initiatives within that, which I'll take you through in just a second. So what we want to do in this talk is introduce you to Call for Code and uh, some of the activities that have been there and kind of the resulting open source projects that have come from it. Uh, we'll talk about how we uh, support those projects, how we improve them, where you can find them uh, through the Linux Foundation website and on GitHub. Uh, I'll talk to you a bit of those projects, kind of show you the background, the technology they use. And um, then we'll talk about how you can contribute in general to open source and um, in particular to these particular projects, where to find the resources, where to find mentors, mentees, uh, other folks in the community that you can share your knowledge with and provide your own solutions to improve these projects and therefore address some of the key societal issues that they address. So uh, Call for Code as a program was launched in 2018. It was an issue between IBM, the Linux Foundation, the United Nations, and David Clark Cause. Uh, he's a fellow that raises awareness and importance to social issues, humanitarian issues, uh, like truth and reconciliation in South Africa, uh, access to clean water throughout the world, veterans issues, and many more topics. So we all partnered in 2018 to look at ways that we can leverage the world's 20 million developers, their skills, leverage those skills to point them at important social issues, important growing issues, and how they can solve that with open source. So what we've done over the years is we've had an annual competition where we lay out a prompt to um, have developers go take that issue on. Uh, we recognize and award them for the work they're done, they've done, but what we do differently with Call for Code is that the solutions that are the top winning solutions, the global winner, uh, potentially some of the runners up, we work with those teams and those projects to transform their raw innovation into something that can live on as a sustainable open source project. And we do that in partnership with the Linux Foundation. So throughout the years um, and throughout the various programs, we've had almost half a million developers building new skills, learning about these important issues and seeing how they can uh, use them to take on these great challenges. And these are issues that affect folks around the world. So we've seen folks come in from just about every continent. I think somebody registered from Antarctica this year. So I'm not sure if we get the seventh continent this year, but we've, we've gotten folks from around the world, every region of the world, and um, even folks who've partnered up in the Slack community with other folks working on similar issues in different parts of the world. If you've heard of Call for Code before, you might have heard of some of the existing programs we've done. So when we launched in 2018, we focused on natural disasters, preparing for them, responding to them, and recovering from them. And the very first winner and the very first project that we brought into Linux Foundation was from a team called Project OWL. And what they did was create an emergency mesh network built on open standards and open source, including um, Arduino, the open hardware platform, uh, MQTT, an open uh, messaging framework, and using mesh network using LoRa, uh, long range radio, another standard, to create an emergency solution for restoring network access after disasters such as Hurricane Maria, where we saw up to nine months people were disconnected from communications, whereas they were able to restore power a little bit quicker. So it's really about um, using cheap and quickly deployable solutions built on open standards to provide that emergency mesh network to provide just enough connectivity to get some messages across uh, to folks who, who need help, uh, from people who need help. Uh, the following year, we, we took the disaster theme a bit further, focusing more on the individual, the health and the well being of individuals. So, another great solution that was just brought to the Linux Foundation as the Peer Up project 
He was from Prometeo. Uh, they're a team that was composed of a firefighter, a nurse, a data scientist, a full stack engineer, and a PhD who came together to see how they can automate the manual process of tracking the chemical exposure of wildlands firefighters in Spain. And so they've created a great IoT solution built on MQTT as well. It uh, emits data back to a data science backend built with a bunch of microservices that compute averages of exposure of the uh, chemicals um, collected by the devices and, um, and uh, saving that to some long-term averages so that nurses and folks can understand how to make better decisions uh, for long-term health outcomes of firefighters. The third year of the global challenge, 2020 was a very transformative year for Call for Code and the projects that came into the Linux Foundation. Uh, we had a dual track. There was one around climate change, so treating the cause rather than the symptom, which was the disasters. Uh, a solution that we're going to be bringing into Linux Foundation soon is around helping smallholder firefight, um, smallholder firefighters, smallholder farmers in emerging nations understand how they can uh, consume uh, upcoming weather forecasts together with long-term trends from NASA, uh, bring that data together using um, a data science and put it in a digestible format so that folks who are being affected by climate change know when to plant crops, uh, where to do it and what to plant uh, using that information uh, so that they can respond better and be more resilient to climate change. We also added uh, the track for the pandemic last year, the social and business impact uh, so there's some solutions we created around social distancing, getting access to microfunding for startups that were affected by uh, the downturn in the economy. Uh, so you'll see some programs there as well. But uh, the biggest part of 2020 last year, 2020 was huge <laughs> with, uh, with the pandemic, with climate change, is Call for Code for Racial Justice. So this is a program that started out within IBM with seven open source projects uh, created in response to the big flashpoint and big uh, brought to the for forefront racial injustice issues last year and how technology can be used to help address some of those solutions. So we have seven open source projects uh, specifically in the Call for Code for Racial Justice area of the Call for Code program. Um, and uh, that brings us to a total of 14 projects that are available for you to learn about, contribute to, and, um, and help uh, advance and deploy around the world. So I mentioned too, it's not just about creating new ideas to take on these challenges. What we really try to do with the Call for Code program and why we rely on folks like you is we need to take this raw innovation that comes into the challenges each year or through challenges that may emerge over the course of the year for particular issues. We need to bring them from that raw promise through an incubation framework where we can improve the hardware, the software, the data science, but also validate those solutions with community members uh, who use them, who can validate with the developers, you know, are we solving the right, the right problem here? Are we doing this the correct way? Are we aware of this maybe uh, law that we weren't aware of? Um, have we got the documentation in the right languages? Have they been translated? And what we do through this incubation framework with the community is bring them to a point where they can live on as those sustainable projects with an ecosystem of users and ideally um, have some sustainable organization backing them um, in partnership with others at the Linux Foundation as a neutral home. Uh, so we, we call this the deployment framework and usually uh, towards the end of it, the implementation is when we officially launch those projects at the Linux Foundation where you can uh, learn about them, participate in the community um, and, and, and join and be a, a main uh, maintainer of the projects. So uh, let's take a look at the, the technical pieces before we get into the non-technical. So if you're familiar already with the Linux Foundation's approach to open source, um, you may know that if you go to linuxfoundation.org slash projects, you'll find a whole gamut of uh, solutions that the organization manages beyond call for code. Uh, there are lots of umbrellas around particular areas that you can explore. And so uh, call for code itself has its own sub umbrella there. And that has information on the 14 projects. We've got them that they correspond to two GitHub organizations. There's the original one that was created for the natural disaster and climate themes. And we've added a new GitHub organization, uh, particularly where you can find the call for code for racial justice projects. Um, there's also another initiative 
Acolinux Foundation that is, it would be something uh, of interest folks as well. It's, it's a part of the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation called the Inclusive Naming Initiative. Uh, so that's also one where as a non-technical contributor, you might um, help them formulate the right terms to use as we, um, we talk about technology in an inclusive way. Just to give you a quick overview then of the particular projects, um, they are kind of segmented into these two umbrellas, but uh, they all are call for code projects. We have uh, the PIRA project I mentioned came from the Chromateo team. It's around monitoring toxin exposure to uh, firefighters. We would love to see um, anybody who wants to adopt this technology, uh, maybe you're a volunteer first responder, maybe you're someone who has a background in emergency communications and uh, potentially even uh, an expert in carbon dioxide, long-term exposure. Uh, that's one where you could bring your expertise to the project. For the cluster duct protocol, that's the emergency mesh network one. Um, maybe you're a ham radio operator. Maybe you have some interest in emergency communications, uh, things like that. Those are, those are definitely areas where we can uh, love to see your adoption there. Isaac Simo is a project that is focused on the uh, in emerging nations, uh, improving construction quality, sometimes in the absence of national standards or regional standards. What it is a visual recognition project that assesses building quality um, to ensure that work done to fix or, or remediate a structure has been done correctly. Um, so within that project, we need folks to who may be in the construction industry um, or otherwise interested in architecture, um, whether the visual recognition models are trained on the right data to make the right decisions as to whether it's properly done or not. Uh, so lots of ways you can get involved with that one too. Maybe you bring different country um, expertise. It has been focused on Nepal and Colombia to date. Um, so if you have uh, areas that you're interested in the world where uh, certain construction types or affected by certain disaster types like hurricanes, wind storms, things like that, you can take part in that. Uh, for Open EEW, this is a technology that came from a startup called Grio. It focuses on measuring, uh, doing earthquake early warnings. So by distributing a bunch of really highly sensitive seismometers or accelerometers uh, around um, the Caribbean, what it's able to do is gather information, reconcile and confirm that it is indeed a real hurricane or shaking in the ground and alert people in advance. So where we would need help here is seismologists um, who understand some of the algorithms or they understand some of the uh, best places, the cultural areas where populations are, how they do emergency management in, in, in particular countries with a focus on the Caribbean and Mexico. Um, and um, I won't go into the other two projects just yet, but uh, Liquid Prep is another one focused on agriculture that you might be interested in, in taking part in if you're interested in um, how sensors work, how agriculture works, um, how um, weather um, works, um, or how you can translate this type of information into a way that can be used uh, in regions around the world. So those are the climate change disaster focused ones. Um, Demi, why don't you give us a, a quick summary or, uh, a summary of, of each of the seven projects in the call for code for racial justice area. And um, we can kind of phrase those, how those can be contributed to. Sure. So in call for code for racial justice, uh, we have seven projects as Daniel mentioned. Um, so uh, we have um, they fall under three different pillars. So the first one is police, uh, judicial reform, and accountability. And with those projects, we have Fair Change, which is a uh, mobile app that allows people to be able to record interactions with the police in a safe and secure manner. We also have Incident Accuracy Reporting System, which is um, another platform that allows eyewitnesses to record interactions with the police as well as uh, provide um, their own eyewitness accounts of that. And then it would the um, purpose of it is to then corroborate that with official police reports. So if there are any uh, discrepancies or inconsistencies, it flags those reports so that uh, the police department themselves, their administrators can have a good uh, line of sight into any kind of inconsistencies that are coming out of their department. Um, and then lastly, under that pillar, we have the, um, we have public, uh, a public defender focused project, uh, which is uh, open sentencing. So that's for um, public defenders to be able to better understand and better advocate for their clients um, 
when it comes to charges that are brought against them to understand any kind of racial disparities or gender disparities that are, are occurring um, within people who are being charged for that specific crime. Because as we know, there tends to be racial disparities in these kind of charges. Um, and then our second pillar is under, um, is under diverse representation. So with diverse representation, we have Take Two, which is a project that basically allows people to flag uh, any kind of racial um, racialized content online. So if there's any kind of racially biased content uh, that's offensive, they're able to flag that. And it also provides them a way of being able to see potentially if content is biased. So it allows people to contribute to these um, to uh, the database as well as to be able to see and get feedback on that as well. And then lastly, our last pillar focuses on legislation and, and policy. So within that, we have a, a few other solutions with By Fits Voter, which is a platform that allows people to, along their voting journey, to better understand, um, you know, voting deadlines, uh, voting registration deadlines, mail-in ballot deadlines, where the polling locations are, in an effort to uh, just make that process easier and, uh, and fight. Uh, voter suppression um, by providing people with information that they need in an easily accessible manner. We also have Legit Info and Truth Loop, which both seek to provide people with information about legislation, uh, policies within their community, um, and make it easy for them to understand how it impacts them. And then Truth Loop takes um, that to another to a step further by allowing them to then provide feedback on on these legislations. So then they can upload information um, and provide uh, just feedback on how these legislations are affecting them in their day to day. Excellent, excellent. And we do have additional projects that are going to be joining the Linux Foundation on a regular basis. Uh, so we do have some additional projects that might be of interest that fall into those three categories that Demi mentioned. And uh, we do have some other ones um, in the er other areas, uh, the COVID area, the climate change area, the disaster areas as well. Okay, so uh, we do have the, the descriptions are up on uh, Linux Foundation website and on GitHub, but we at IBM also have a set of tutorials that folks can use to learn about these projects um, understand it as an end user. You might want to go in there and just learn about the project, see how it's trying to solve the problem, um, consider how uh, it, whether it's doing the right job or if you have any suggestions for it. You can try it hands-on if you do have some technical in inclination to uh, try to set up the, the solution on your machine or deploy in the cloud. Um, and then there's the contribution guidelines. So each of these projects is governed through a technical steering uh, committee and a technical charter. Uh, that is part of the neutral governance provided by the Linux Foundation. You can learn about um, how the project handles contributions, the code of conduct, uh, what sort of important areas that they want you to contribute to or to focus on. And we do also have um, in, in an additional area on, on the developer website, specifically around those particular issue areas that Demi mentioned. Here we're just showing the policy and legislation reform area. We've got uh, videos. Uh, you can see how the um, what the issue is that's being solved and how the approach has come together. And we also do have complete tutorials uh, for each of those projects so that you can go through, uh, learn about the project and see where your opportunity to contribute might be, uh, whatever your background. Um, but um, we know that you know, technology, particularly even though it's accessible to everybody right now, uh, it, it seems like it can be applied in many different situations and people have the ability to build new skills. There's tons of ways uh, specifically that you can contribute to open source in general and uh, perhaps one or more of these projects in particular. So um, let's take a look at some of those, those ways that uh, you can approach from. So, Kim? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as Daniel mentioned, he's also kind of alluded to it during his presentation earlier. Uh, as you talk through the projects, there are many ways to contribute to um, projects, even if you're not technical. So a lot of times people, when they come into open source communities, you know, there are two concerns they have. It. One, they don't have the skills, and two, they don't have the time, right? So uh, what we've outlined here are just a few possibilities of the types of contributions you can make, even if you're not technical, and also if you have um, if you have different amounts of time available to contribute to these things. So the on the left-hand side, we have the hours, days, and weeks. It's not exactly precise. People might have different uh, perspectives on how long it takes to take, do certain things, but just as a 
just as a measure, uh, just in terms of scale of what it might take to do these things. So the first one, which we find to be the most, uh, the easiest entry point is documentation, because as Daniel mentioned, when you're coming into a project, you want to understand what it's about. So you're going to read the, um, the tutorial, you're going to look at the readme, that's usually the entry point there. And that's a place where you have a great opportunity to um, really welcome and onboard your community. And a lot of times there might be some issues that come with that documentation. So the first thing that you can do um, as a non-technical contributor is you can flag documentation errors. Things as simple as gram grammatical errors or spelling errors are things that you can contribute to um, in terms of updating the documentation. And then secondly, another thing you might want to do is document new features. So as we're bringing on new features, you know, we might not be able to um, describe them or market them essentially in, a, in the way that's most understandable to users. So uh, if you have a background in writing or marketing, you can also help us and work alongside with technical writers to ensure that we're documenting new features in an in a easily to understand way, as well as maybe up updating our release notes um and things of that nature and then lastly uh just in terms of like something that might take a bit much a bit longer to do would be helping us in creating onboarding guides so for instance you know again as you're coming into a new community there are lots there's lots of information that's been created lots of content lots of things to learn lots of past presentations like this or or you know things describing the content so what we'd like to see or one another opportunity for people to get involved is to then help in creating these onboarding guides which can be um, pdfs they can be websites just many different ways to help people get on board and also by using your own personal experience in onboarding you can help to guide the way those guides should go forward because you're able to provide your own personal experience in getting into the community as well and then secondly um there's designing ux so whether you're officially a designer or you, this is just like something that you kind of do on the side or have an interest in, this is also something you can do. So um, for instance, you might help design a logo. I know that's something that was done previously. Uh, I believe Daniel can talk about that. Uh, I think we have Hacktoberfest by a uh, another group as well. Yeah, yeah. So actually coming up on October, there's a yearly uh, initiative. Uh, it's run by DigitalOcean. IBM takes part in it as well as many as other organizations do. So when you go into um, GitHub, you may see things tagged, um, Hacktoberfest, and what they're intended to be are really, for the most part, light lift contributions where uh, you can contribute something in a non-technical way. Uh, normally with an open source community, uh, you don't like to see what we call drive-by commits where you just make one issue and then you leave the community. Uh, we wanna see engagement or a period of time. But what's great about Hacktoberfest is you don't have to really be afraid of that commitment to a project. You can make a small contribution uh, by addressing maybe a long-standing issue or something where the the, um, the maintainers of that project don't have skills uh, that exist out in the broader community. Um, maybe it's, it's user experience, maybe it's um, doing a simple translation, maybe it's doing uh, some piece of work to automate builds uh, or other things that community may long I wanted to implement, but just haven't been able to do it. And that's what Hacktoberfest is all about. Great. Yeah, so during one of those sessions, we're able to get a new logo for one of our, our projects. So that was great. And it's also obviously just like something that happened in the matter of hours and not you know taking forever to get done as well. Um, another thing you might be able to do is conduct user research. So um, a lot of, for our projects, these are tech for good projects who which have a direct end user, which can be across a lot of different spheres. So farmers, um, firefighters, public defenders, as we mentioned. So we want to be, be sure that these solutions are actually meeting the needs of the users. So providing user research, getting the feedback from people as they're using the product, as they're, as they're using the solution, as they're, um, as we're de developing prototypes is another way you can contribute as well. And then also on a larger scale, it can also help us in updating the UI. Um, so a lot of times with our projects, we're looking to improve them. So another way you can get involved is to help us do that improvement, taking, taking in the feedback from the user research and helping us update the UI or just update the user interface or um, the user experience if it's like a hardware tool, for instance. And then um, another uh, way to contribute is if you are a lawyer, for instance, and we do have, find a lot of need for this within our call for good racial justice projects is um, you can answer questions if there are any, have any drive-by legal questions that we might have. Um, for some of our solutions, we um, like for the legislation solutions such as Truth Loop um, and Legit Info, 
uh, we need to populate our database with that legislation. So if you're able to point us to uh, reference legislation, like maybe in a particular state or in a particular country, that's another way you can, you can contribute. You can also help out in by helping us review licenses, whether these are like open source licenses or other things um, that we might be thinking about engaging in. That's another way of engaging as well. Um, for subject matter experts, and we know this varies across there are many different subject matter experts, as Daniel's mentioned, like we talked about um, seismologists, we talked about firefighters, we talked about public defenders, um, lots of different ways and areas you can be a subject matter expert in. And depending on the project, there are ways for you to provide help with us. So as we mentioned before, uh, related to user research, you can actually provide user feedback. You can provide relevant data. So that's um, data curation or manually updating our database uh, by providing us uh, doing some crowdsourcing of data that we might need. You might also be part of our advisory council, uh, depending on what the project is. We might have a council of people who actually provide oversight um, relevant to that specific area just because they have expertise there. Um, and if you're not a subject matter expert, you can still be an advocate for our community. So a simple way to do this would be to share our projects in your community. So whether that's on Reddit or any other um, Slack groups that you're part of, or any other online communities or in-person communities that might be interested in that. So for instance, if you're a public defender, you might be a part of a professional organization. So you might talk, talk to them about using this uh, some of our um, solutions and um, things like that. You can also speak at a conference. So something similar to this, um, maybe specific to your industry, you can talk about uh, the projects that we have and that provides you with like a larger reach potentially to get the word out about the solutions. And you can be a project champion. Um, so specifically, this might this is something that we have uh, with our call for code projects here. And Daniel can probably speak to a few examples of projects that have champions today. Um, and yeah, so that's just another way you can get involved. So that's kind of a more committed way of of um, getting the word out about the project. You know, sharing about, sharing it out on LinkedIn and just being an advocate for the project in a more in a long term uh, fashion. So Daniel, if you want to speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think it's really important too that the building on the network thing. So we're, we're speaking at a technical conference, so there is a bit of an implication that you have some technical background, um, and so you have a very important role in terms of bridging uh, this community to the communities in your area, in your your neighborhood, where you can be that advocate to talk about. Okay, I have my feet in both these areas. I'm uh, I know a lot of issues around legal and licensing and access to privacy and data, and yet I, this technology project hasn't been introduced to them. So you could do a lunch and learn, hey, listen, I know we have this long-standing problem in our community. Um, here's a technology solution we would love to explore. Let's see if we can get a, um, you know, a prototype or a pilot done with the technology. So that's a really important part of the, the advocacy. Now, speaking directly around the champions, um, so specifically within uh, IBM, we do have IBM champions, and what they do is they have a specific responsibility. Uh, it's an honor each year to be named an IBM champion uh, who is somebody outside the company that's an advocate for the technology that's being used, whether it's an open source project, a strategic one that IBM participates in, Kubernetes, um, containers, uh, things like that, blockchain. Uh, it is a way to be recognized for, for doing that. So we do have within the call code community several folks who have become IBM champions uh, from the Project Owl team uh, to the Prometeo team uh, and as well as the SafeQ team. So uh, definitely an option there to be recognized and build your own influence, your own eminence as, as somebody in the community interested in seeing how technology can take on these issues. Okay. And lastly, uh, it's on our list today, and of course, there are many other ways to contribute is just being a part of the community, right? Because um, community is basically the lifeblood of open source um, projects essentially because that's how we're able to ensure that we have contributors and also bring new people into the community who might contribute. So even if you're not necessarily um, going to be contributing whether technically or non-technically, you can still um, use your social networks to be able to draw other people into the community as well. So um, a low lift way of doing this is just attending community events, you know, networking with people, understanding what the needs are, um, participating in that way. And you might graduate from that and actually decide to organize a community event. Um, so maybe just a one-time event where you're maybe talking about um, anything that you're an expert in. Like recently we had somebody who came into our, who was part of our community who talked about writing unit tests. So providing just that kind of um, teaching to our community was very valuable and just a way to enrich the overall experience for people, not just in terms of 
of um, contributing to code, but also improving their skills as open source contributors at large, right? Whether that's building the technical skills, learning a bit about more non-technical issues too, um, you can do that. That's another way you can, you can uh, be a part of that community just by sharing your skills, even beyond the specific scope of a particular project. And lastly, another way you might want to be um, a, a community contributor would be to lead a regional chapter or lead a university chapter or some kind of university grouping that's associated um, with the project that you are a part of. So that's definitely something that takes a bit more uh, commitment and it's more long term, but that's just another way uh, to be invo involved as a community member as well. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and one thought just on top of that is what's also great is you can uh, apply the same skill over and over across all 14 projects. You can deeply get into one project if you're interested in, because um, they all have very common needs in many ways. Um, if there's always help uh, needed for, for example, translations or fixing typos, improving documentation um, across the board, making sure things are consistent. Uh, so we do really appreciate um, not only a deep dive into projects with your skill set, but also seeing how you can spread them across the projects, help us um, make them more accessible and ready to others. And uh, that's really an important part of being a non-technical contributor. Okay, great. So now we talked about some of the, the, the things you can do. Let's talk a little bit about how you actually can can get them, get started with this, get involved. So um, Demi, uh, why don't you take us through these specific actions and how we can take those those needs and kind of show people how they can get started. Right, so um, we've identified three major ways that you can get involved. They kind of progress uh, um, across this these three buckets here. So the first is to join the virtual community and uh, because we are primarily virtual um, uh, these days. So uh, it's really helpful for us because we're already on, we were already on Slack. So um, joining something like Slack or Discord, in our case, um, if you do want to join our Slack, you can do so by uh, filling out this invitation form, which is callforcode.org slash Slack uh, to get an invitation into our Slack community, which is our call for code um, Slack community. Um, and then once you are in Slack, you'll, you are able to then find channels um, within our call for code, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we have many channels for our different projects and you're able to just go in there and um, really find the one that's the best fit for you uh, based on your interests, based on your you know time commitment abilities, um, and based on whatever it is that they're actively working on at that time. Uh, for a call for code for racial justice uh, within our general Slack community, you're able to join the racial justice general channel. And then once you join those channels, uh, primarily, you know, we're doing things there that we can't do in GitHub, right? So we're planning events, you know, sending out polls as to when we should have things. Um, so you can also join events and uh, stay abreast of what's happening from that perspective in the community as far as events and um, just gatherings to talk about projects. And then the second thing you can do um, once you're a part of the community, you, you know, you've joined Slack or even in parallel is that you can join us on GitHub. So for instance, our projects live on GitHub. So you want to have a GitHub account and um, you want to browse different repositories, uh, star the repositories. So for Call for Code for Racial Justice, our main repository is Call for Code uh, for Racial Justice um, in GitHub. And then there you'll see our sub um, sub repositories as well for each of our different projects. And you then you can read the documentation as we mentioned earlier on, that's a good way to start contributing, reading our documentation, reading our readmes. If you find any issues there, you can um, create issues uh, to update those errors that there might be uh, within that documentation. Um, and then you can also find existing issues. So uh, within our projects, what we try to do is have both technical and non-technical issues that you can con you can contribute to. Um, so then you can flag those issues and you know assign them to yourselves and begin to work on them um, as you get into the community. And also you can also create issues. So for instance, if you're talking to other people in Slack, you have a great idea or you're you know discussing in the comments in um, a GitHub issue, you can also have fine opportunities of new things you might not have considered, maybe new feature sets, maybe deeper dives into data sets that we need to do. And you can create issues there within GitHub as well. And then lastly, the other way to get involved, as we mentioned before, is also just outreach, right? So um, everyone has their own network and uh, we our networks are valuable to contributing to our general community and the open source of, um, advancement of these projects. So 
the easy first step was, you know, just to recruit your friends or colleagues, people you work with on other projects who might have similar interests already. So for instance, as we mentioned before, if you're part of a professional organization that might have a synergy with a project, you might want to mention it to them, recruit those people to join um, or to learn about an event, even if they don't want to join the entire community, they can still uh, participate in uh, coming to one of our events. Um, and the second thing is networking. So um, as you're going to professional organizations, uh, conferences and things of that nature, you also have the opportunity to network and mention, um, as you mentioned before, and advocate for uh, specific projects that you might be working on. Um, and as we mentioned, you also have the opportunity to host events right, um, around these projects or around similar issues where you can mention the projects um, and get people involved that way. And lastly, another thing that you might want to do, especially if you're um, you're starting an open source community of your own, um, is you might want to add your open source repositories and issues to open source contribution sites. So for instance, there's code triage that you might want to add, uh, or first time first timers only is another one where you can actually have your open source um, issues be a part of those um, websites so other people can just quickly pick up new issues and get started on them as well. Excellent, excellent. So I'm just before we get into, um, uh, I'm going to take you through kind of a, how you actually get started right away in there. Um, as Demi mentioned, we've got the Call for Code community. Join that. There's tons of uh, channels. I'll show you those, a few of those in a minute. Um, we do have the projects you can discover on linuxfoundation.org site and the technical resources for doing a deep dive, the tutorials on our developer site. Uh, we've got the organizations. You can go find your open issues for those two things and um, and sharing um, with your network. So let me swap over to um, uh, just kind of show you a few of these things. So uh, to join Slack, uh, what you'll need to do, there's golfco.org. Uh, it'll give you, you'll fill out this form. If you already have an account, you can uh, log in there. Uh, you just got to make sure you're good with the privacy policy. Um, make sure you're good with uh, abiding by the code of conduct to make sure we have a very uh, welcoming community and inclusive community. And um, just provide your name and then um, basically uh, your email address and you'll end up getting an invitation to the Slack community. Once you're in there, um, there is a pinned message to our general channel. Again, it covers all of the programs within Call for Code. Uh, there are some default channels you'll find, um, but if you want, uh, general is the main one. You can introduce yourselves, uh, learn about some of the goings on in the community. We've got channels for each of the projects out there. Uh, and in particular for racial justice, we've got a landing community. Uh, Demi is very active in there. Uh, she can find information on the events, the uh, the requests from the community, um, the the kind of out, uh, sort of things that you can uh, grab onto and contribute to. Um, and um, there are listings of events as well as a help desk. Uh, so for example, if you do wanna find um, how to use a particular technology, maybe you have an issue uh, understanding IoT, understanding data science, uh, you can definitely reach out to folks there. Uh, there's tons of um, tons of channels. We've got over 25,000 folks in here uh, willing to help you out, willing to st uh, steer you in the right direction. So that's a, that's your first place to start. Um, as I mentioned, there's the Linux Foundation website, and there is a project catalog repo. It's pinned to the main uh, call for code one, uh, where you can kind of learn more about those particular projects, their backgrounds, and specifically drive into the repos. And one of the things I, I realized we didn't mention earlier that we do have available to non-technical first-time open source users. Uh, we've got under our project sample repository, a link to the um, uh, a new open source course that we released earlier this year. And the intent was for uh, non-technical uh, uh, people who wanted to take part in open source communities, um, how they can actually start to use the tool sets. So GitHub can be a little bit confusing for new users. It is code oriented, but people use it, authors use it. My sister, she's a professor, she uses it to manage and version her own content. Um, so if you go into this, it's a free course. Uh, you can get a uh, certificate for completing it after about uh, four to six hours. And it's got really uh, important, um, uh, lays down the background of what open source is. Um, why it's important, some of the rules of the road, uh, how to use the tools like GitHub to contribute. And um, if you are interested in kind of starting your own repository around a particular issue, uh, you can do that as well. So this was really intended with you in mind. 
um, and expanding open source skills as part of digital literacy. Uh, it's becoming important as, as learning how to use a computer and typing were in previous um, generations. So we invite you to take a look at that. Uh, again, it's linked through uh, our GitHub, uh, but you can find it, Instruction Open Source on Cognitive Class. Uh, if you dive into the, the repos, um, you can definitely check out the activity that's going on. You can meet the people there, kind of find out who's been working on what. You'll see um, uh, what particular um, issues are. You can uh, check out how many forks and how many different versions of the code is being uh, worked on by uh, folks in the community. Uh, and again, just find them and, and star them and share them with others uh, through the community. Uh, let's see if there's anything else we wanted to, to oh yeah, I did want to cover uh, the developer resources quickly. So right now, if you go to the developer.ibm.com slash call for code, you'll see there's information on the yearly competition um, as well as past winners. Uh, each of the open source project groupings we talked about today are, are available here. And um, you can check out some of the stories of the existing projects that have been deployed, uh, the background of the communities that are there, um, and any sort of other uh, information uh, that may be of interest to you. So let me just dive into the call for code for racial justice ones, um, which did have those three uh, focus areas. So you can, you can kind of see how they're grouped. Uh, you can check out the videos, uh, things like that. So lots of resources. We really want to make it easier for, easy for anybody to contribute and, um, and, and bring these projects forward and really make an, an impact on the world. Um, so with that, Demi, did you have any other um, final parting thoughts? I know, by the way, this is pre-recorded in advance, but it will be played during the time slot um, during Open Source Summit. Uh, we'll be around um, to answer any questions if you have them live there. You can find us in Slack. If you don't find us there, we're, we're definitely around. Um, but we do want to make it as easy as possible for you to take part in these communities. Um, Demi, any parting thoughts? No, just looking forward to your questions, and we look forward to seeing you in the community. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, um, much appreciated. Um, and we look forward to your contributions, technical or otherwise. Have a great day.